All right, up next in our industry update, uh, we have Brian Cook, technical manager from Clariant out of Sellersburg, Indiana. He's going to report on the adsorptive removal of contaminants from fats and oils for production of biofuels. And uh, Brian, if you want to take it away, first tell us a little bit about yourself and before uh, we uh, hear your presentation. Hello, everybody. Manager for North America. And I have the pleasure to talk to you about the removal of contaminants from fats and oils that are used to produce biofuels. To get started, we'll start with a brief introduction, look at the uh, adsorption process and talk a little bit about bleaching clay characteristics. We'll then move in and talk about both biodiesel and renewable diesel production and how those contaminants that are present in the fats and oils need to be removed for those processes. And we'll end with a brief summary. So as an introduction, both biodiesel and renewable diesels are both derived from fats and oils. The biodiesel, the difference between the two, biodiesel is a methyl ester. We'll go into a little bit more detail on what that entails. Whereas renewable diesel converts those fats and oils directly to hydrocarbons, very similar to petroleum-based diesels. Some of the problems that arise from the fats and oils is they can they can contain contaminants which can interfere with the reaction in biodiesel and also decrease the catalyst for the renewable diesel process. For biodiesel we're going to look at the pretreatment of the fat and oil to remove contaminants in the feedstock as well as as after the reaction is completed there are some contaminants that still need to be removed before that product is actually biodiesel. For renewable diesel, we're mainly concerned with the pretreatment, trying to remove those contaminants as much as possible up front to protect the catalyst and help the life of that catalyst. So just as a basic introduction, uh, we have fat, saturated fatty acids and unsaturated fatty acids are connected to a glycerol backbone. That's what makes up the triglyceride. Saturated fatty acids are more stable they're less prone to go undergo oxidation, but especially for biodiesel, they cause code flow issues uh, at the end of the process. Unsaturated fatty acids are less stable and they're more prone to undergo oxidation, which is more important for biodiesel because biodiesel converts those fatty acids into methyl esters. And so you still have those fatty acid molecules there that can undergo oxidation. Whereas with renewable diesel, those are converted to hydrocarbons and you don't have the oxidation issues. So now we're gonna talk about the adsorption of contaminants and a little bit about bleaching clays. To start with here, we need to understand the difference between absorption and adsorption. Absorption is just the accumulation of the liquid within a solution. Whereas adsorption, you're actually selectively, selectively removing contaminants. So the best example I can think of is if you had a solution of water with sodium hydroxide that is totally dissolved, you put a sponge in, that sponge is gonna soak up both the hydro, sodium hydroxide and the water. Whereas with adsorption, if you had that same situation and you took that sponge and squeezed it and just the water came out and the sodium hydroxide was held onto the sponge, then we're talking about an adsorption phenomenon. So when we're talking about the adsorption filtration process, we're gonna be removing those soluble impurities. It's also, also gonna provide depth filtration. As you build up the material on the filter cake, you're going to be removed down to one micron or less. So you're gonna result in a higher quality feedstock for both biodiesel or renewable diesel. You're gonna help achieve re regulatory specifications by removing those metals and contaminants up front. That'll help with the reaction as well. So uh, reaction efficiency is gonna be improved. And on renewable diesel, you're gonna increase the life of the catalyst. Just very briefly, we're gonna look at the origin of bentonite. Uh, Clarion produces uh, bentonite products as 
Legion clays. So years ago, volcanoes shot up lava that had gas and ash. Sometimes that traveled as much as 16 miles. The ash, as it falls, it gets carried away by the wind and water. And over time, those deposits are subjected to high pressure temperatures and they form bentonite. So the, the landscape undergoes massive changes and what's left behind is the calcium bentonite products that's, that are then processed to make uh, clays. One of the things we want to look at is if you just dug the, the clay out of the ground and you know processed that as is, you're going to look at a surface area of about 60 mil, uh, square meters per gram and a bulk density of about 800 grams per liter. To increase that surface area and really give it a boost to remove those contaminants, that clay is subjected to acid with temperature, pressure, and time to form what we call a acid activated bleaching earth. So that's going to increase the surface area to about 200 square meters per gram or a little higher and also reduce the bulk density. These products have been used for many years in the edible oil and mineral oil uh, industries and also in biofuels as well as we're talking about today. So to take a closer look at the biodiesel production. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on the reaction, but uh, basically you start with the triglyceride. So if you had 100 kilograms, you would react that with 10 kilograms of methanol in the presence of a catalyst to form 100 kilograms of fatty acid methyl esters and 10 kilograms of glycerin. So during this reaction, we do have glycerin as a byproduct that needs to be taken care of, whether that's sold or uh, used for a different application. We look closer at the process as a, so, so you start with the fat or oil that gets reacted with methanol and you form biodiesel at the end of the process. But there's a lot of nuances to consider as you go through this reaction process. The first part of this is the, the pretreatment. So you, you want to take your fat and oil and remove as much contaminants from that as possible. Uh, you'll have metals, you may have soap, you may have some residual uh, free fatty acid that needs to be removed, but that should be taken care of in the pretreatment process. And then another thing to keep in mind is if you have an FFA greater than 2%, you really want to consider doing a direct esterification process where you directly convert those free fatty acids into methyl esters. If you didn't do that process and you went straight to the trans esterification reaction with the sodium hydroxide catalyst, then you would form a lot of soap that would create a, uh, a lot of emulsion and it'd be very difficult to separate. So for that direct esterification process, an, an acid is used for the catalyst to convert that. So at the end of this process, we do have, we end up with uh, contaminated meth methyl esters after the glycerol is separated. You're going to have some residual glycerin. Uh, you may have some metals that made it through that need to be removed at the tail end of the process. So you have a post uh, processing step that you have to do, whether that's uh, just a water wash, a water wash with distillation. But typically after that, you still wanna do a final polish to make sure the biodiesel meets the specifications and that all the contaminants are removed. So that's where another uh, place where the use of a, an adsorbent can come into play. So as we look a little bit more detail on some of the contaminants that need to be removed, uh, the left side of this page shows soap removal. So this particular feedstock had about 500 parts per million soap. That was treated and filtered with 0.2% bleaching clay, able to take that down to about 150 parts per million. But in order to remove all that soap that was in there, a half percent by weight, bleaching clay was able to achieve 100% removal of the soap. Phosphorus is another contaminant that really can interfere with the reaction in biodiesel. You can see the, the oil feedstock started with about 20 parts per million. And again, that same trend, we used 0.2% that took it down to about 12 parts per million. But in order to get that down to uh, levels below detection, 
a half percent by weight bleaching clay was used. And it's important to get that phosphorus down as low as possible, preferably less than two parts per million for the reaction process. When we're looking at the post-reaction process, as I said, the glycerin gets separated from the fatty acid methyl esters. At this point, you have contam contaminated fatty acid methyl esters. They're not biodiesel until they meet the specifications. And so some of the contaminants that need to be removed include some residual glycerin, soaps, some metals, and excess methanol or catalyst that made it through the reaction. So looking at the post-reaction, some of the things to keep in mind, soap formation, that results again from the alkaline catalyst reaction with the free fatty acid. Uh, if you had oleic acid, for example, that would form sodium oleate. So that, uh, that can come from high FFA feedstocks, uh, excess water in the reaction. You wanna keep that reaction as dry as possible uh, because you can get direct saponification of the triglycerides if you have enough water in the system. It could also indicate an improper amount of catalyst. That can cause emulsion problems. And so when you go to separate the glycerin from the methyl esters, you're gonna have some, some issues trying to do that. Uh, soap is gonna require more adsorbent. The more soap you have, the more adsorbent you're gonna need. Uh, looking at some other things, uh, insufficient catalyst removal that can cause injector deposits, filter plugging in the engine, poor glycerin separation, uh, that can cause reversion, make the reaction go backwards so you can actually start to form mono dye and triglycerides. If you have a high acid value, that can decrease the shelf life. It can lead to oxidation. Those uh, acidic molecules can really act as a catalyst to further oxidize the, the product. Insufficient alcohol removal, uh, there's a safety concern there, of course, uh, but that can cause premature injector failures in the engine. So it's important to make sure all of these contaminants are removed, uh, not only up front, but at the final polish for the biodiesel production process. Looking at some other things to keep in mind, you may have some hazy precipitates that are found in the finished product. Those could be sterile glucosides, maybe some saturated monoglycerides. So those need to be removed as well uh, during this process. And the good thing about using an adsorbent to remove the other contaminants is they will remove the sterile glucosides as well at higher temperatures. So you, you don't have to cool the biodiesel down to actually precipitate those products out. You can do that at temperature and they'll be removed as well. So now we're gonna talk about renewable diesel and what contaminants are present and why they need to be removed from the process. So renewable diesel is a true car, uh, hydrocarbon, just like uh, petroleum diesel. It meets the ASTM specifications for diesel fuels. Uh, it has a different structure than biodiesel, which we've talked about. Biodiesel has that methyl ester structure, so you have to worry about oxidation, uh, not so much for renewable diesel. So for the renewable diesel, you're hydro treating the product with a catalyst, which is a highly active uh, catalyst that's used to remove the oxygen and nitrogen and produce the diesel fuel for production. The pretreatment is essential for this process because that catalyst is very expensive and especially contaminants such as phosphorus really need to be removed because that can really poison the life of the catalyst and cause a significant investment uh, premature disposal of the catalyst. So when we're looking at bleaching clay and renewable diesel process, look at the, the process here. You start with the fatter or the oil, you go through the pretreatment process to remove the phosphorus and other metals, because other metals can interfere with the catalyst also, but phosphorus is the most problematic. That then goes through the hydro treating reactor with the catalyst to produce your renewable diesel, which is sometimes called uh, green diesel. 
and you have propane as a byproduct, which can be reused in the process. So here we're going to focus on the pretreatment process for this reaction. I'm not going to go into all the detail on the chemical reaction that, that takes place to form the hydrocarbons, but it's basically a decarbo decarboxylation of the organic molecules followed by a isomerization step to produce the petroleum based or the I'm sorry the renewable diesel uh, at the end of the process as well as propane and some naphtha as a byproduct as well. So during the reaction the catalyst is required to conduct these reactions as, and as we've talked about before the life of that catalyst is important because it's a very expensive catalyst. So as I've talked about a little bit, the, the catalyst poison is mainly by the phosphatide compounds. These are some examples of phosphatides here on the right. I'm not gonna go into detail on each one of them, but there are some that are pretty, uh, uh, most relevant, uh, like lecithin, uh, you might be familiar with that, but these, these compounds contain phosphorus, which can poison the catalyst and decrease the life of the catalyst. The origin of phospholipids, so a simplified drawing, you see it has a nonpolar tail and a polar head. They tend to form micelles. So a large amount of the phospholipids uh, come from cell membranes, and again, they migrate together to form micelles. So a, a lot of these can be removed uh, by the acid water degumming process to remove the hydratable uh, phospholipids, but the non-hydratable phospholipids will remain behind with the oil, and those are the ones that need to be removed with an adsorbent. So looking at the non-hydratable phospholipids, they're often stabilized with calcium or magnesium. You can see the process here on the left. You have the, the phospholipids interacting with the acid clay. They get bound to the clay surface and then they're filtered out so they never reach the catalyst and uh, damage the catalyst. The right hat to side of the table here, you're just looking at the adsorbent dosage is going to be proportional to the phosphorus concentration. So, I mean, if you have something that has 340 parts per million phosphorus, you're going to be using a lot more adsorbent than you have than you would with something using a, a hundred parts per million phosphorus. So here is kind of a, uh, a diagram showing this is the filter cake that's uh, formed on the on the filter with the bleaching clay. There's your catalyst. You have your oil with the phosphorus going through hitting the catalyst and you see the phosphorus is left behind on the uh, filter cake so it never reaches the, the uh, catalyst. On the right there is just kind of a picture of what this isolated phospholipid material looks like when it's trapped on the filter cake. So the next couple of slides, we're going to look at some examples. Uh, we can start it with a yellow grease. The phosphorus was 85 parts per million. That went through an acid uh, degumming water wash to remove that down to about 19 parts per million. After the use of 1% by weight clay, that was reduced down to one and a half parts per million, down to the less than that two parts per million as we talked about before. So the life of that catalyst is really going to be extended by removing all that phosphorus. And you can see a significant amount of it came out with the acid degumming and water wash process, but there's still a significant portion that needs to be removed with the adsorbent process. Again, here's another example. Uh, this particular example, you're looking at uh, some high performance bleaching earth. So they're using a lot more acid and temperature and pressure to really increase that surface area. And you can see it took about a 0.75% by weight treatment to remove that phosphorus that started at 20 parts per million down to less than one part per million. And then you also had a total metal removal of 91%. So 
you're really protecting that catalyst and preventing those contaminants from, from hitting that catalyst. Looking at filterability, that's another important aspect. We're able to control the porosity and the particle size. So uh, looking at this, this table, you can see the bottom, the x-axis shows the time it took to filter and the y-axis shows how much oil was filtered in that time. So adsorbent A was able to filter 300 grams of oil in about 80 seconds, whereas B and C took 200 and 300 seconds to, to filter that same, same oil. So filterability is another important aspect since you're doing a filtration process. Uh, you want to have high throughput as well as contaminant removal. So to summarize, adsorbents are processing aids that can help prevent the contaminants, uh, both for the biodiesel process as well as the renewable diesel process. The activation of those clays is, is done through the use of an acid with temperature and, and pressure. Uh, porosity and particle size are controlled so that you have uh, better filterability, better flow. Uh, the better flow you have, the more you can process and the less you'll have to clean out the filter. The adsorbents can also be used as a final polish for biodiesel to help achieve re regulatory specifications. And the use of the catalyst or the adsorbent can really help increase the life of the catalyst and uh, help significantly with the cost and associated with the renewable diesel production process. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'll be more than glad to answer any questions when we have the question and answer uh, session later on. Thank you again. Thanks a lot, Brian. Uh, first, I want to apologize for the technical glitch that I caused. I did not give Brian the, the proper introduction. I'm going to do that uh, uh, post-presentation and before our, our uh, questions here. Um, Brian is the technical manager for Clarion to North America, in case you, know, you didn't gather that already. Um, he's in functional minerals, involved with oleochemical applications for over 25 years. He's a degree in chemistry from Indiana University. Before Clarion, he spent his career at the Dallas Group in uh, Dieselite Minerals. He's given numerous lectures regarding filtration and absorption during industry events like AOCS, Eurofeed Lipid, and other industrial short courses. Now we'll go into uh, a couple questions here. Uh, Brian, what are the oil losses associated with the clay filter cake, and why should uh, BD and RD producers choose ABE versus other synthetic adsorbents? So typically with uh, bleaching clays, it's about uh, 25 to 40% by weight of the clay is gonna be the oil retention inside. And that's gonna depend on a lot, a lot of factors. The, the main factor that's gonna depend on is the porosity of the particles. And with our products, uh, the way they're produced, we're able to control that porosity till we, we have a, a large porosity which decreases the amount of oil retention. So it's more on the line of the 25 to 30% uh, by weight of the, the clay being used. And what was the second part of that question? Why should uh, producers choose ABE versus other synthetic adsorbents? So uh, there's a lot of factors that go into looking at the overall quality of the oil going into the process. So number one, you want to concentrate on products that work, that you know work, and they've been used for many years uh, to remove the phosphorus and metals from the oils. And then you also want to take a look at the total cost of ownership. So uh, if you're looking at a synthetic product, you're going to have a significantly higher cost associated with that. And those products typically won't filter as well and have a little bit higher oil retention. So when you put all those pieces together, the activated bleaching earth is a, uh, a much lower total cost of ownership for the process. Okay. Could you comment on the parameters influencing expected useful life and disposal of the product? 
So the the useful life of the clays. So I mean, the, basically, what, what we're talking about there is the higher the higher the amount of contaminants you have in the raw material or the feedstock coming in, the more adsorbent it's going to require. Uh, typically, you can see up to a few hundred parts per million of phosphorus coming in, but a lot of that's removed during the acid water degumming process, and so you're you're, you're left after that process with something around 15 to 30 parts per million phosphorus, and that's going to take about a half to 1% by weight of bleaching clay to remove that phosphorus from the feedstock. Once that clay has been used, it has to be, it, it's, only, it's a one-time use. Uh, it's, it, you can't really reuse it. Once it's uh, absorbed what it's going to absorb, you can't really get any more activity out of it. So disposal is something we're always looking at uh, with renewable diesel. It's a bit difficult because of the feedstocks we're dealing with, animal fats and yellow grease, used cooking oils. Whereas with edible oils, some of that feed, some of that uh, filter cake can be actually added to animal feed. That's not the case for the renewable di diesel industry. So it's something that we we're aware of and we're, we're looking at ways to, uh, mitigate the the losses associated with having to dispose that material. So renewable diesel versus biodiesel is a is a good lead in here. On average, how much more uh, adsorbent is used in renewable diesel than in biodiesel? It's pr it's pretty close to to being equivalent. Again, that's going to depend on the feedstock. If you're if you're a biodiesel producer that crushes your own soybean oil seed then typically you're going to, to process that oil anyway uh, with a bleaching clay to remove the phosphorus and the chlorophyll, which is not important for that process. But those contaminants are typically removed prior to going into the process. But if you're a renewable diesel processor that is purchasing yellow grease or a used cooking oil or an animal fat, then you have to make sure you have that pretreatment process in place for your for your setup for your renewable diesel plant. Okay. What is the typical loss of oil to the bleaching clay and what happens to leftover bleaching clay? Uh, that's what we just talked about. Uh, the typical losses are about 20 that 25 to 40 percent range. And again for the renewable diesel just because of the nature of the feedstocks, uh, the filter cake, the spent filter cake is being landfilled right now, uh, but that's something that we are actively looking at different ways to, to mitigate those losses associated with that. Okay. Do any metals leach out of the clay? There's no metals that are going to leach out of the clay. Uh, it's, it's processed in a way to where those, uh, it's acid activated, but the acid is washed back out and the only purpose of the acid is really to increase the surface area and increase the ability to actually remove the metals from the, the feedstock. Okay, and it looks like a last question. How does high FFA in the feedstock affect the absorption capacity of ABE? That's not gonna have an effect on the absorption capacity. Uh, we're talking about metal removal. The activated clays typically are not going to remove FFA anyway, so that is uh, not going to interfere with the other contaminants that need to be removed. Okay, looks like that is all our questions. Thanks a lot, Brian, for your presentation. Uh, very interesting. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Ryan.